So uh, in today's class, we are going to finish the description of the shortest curves in the hyperboloid that we uh, started doing uh, last time. And we are going to introduce the upper half plane. Um, actually, we are going to introduce its uh, Riemannian metric because we, we already introduced the, the upper half plane as, as, a, as a set. Um, today, we are going to put a non Euclidean Riemannian metric on it. So, this is the plan of today's lecture. So, let's start. With the last part, with the, the with the last part of the description of the shortest curves in the hyperboloid, yeah. And last time uh, I mentioned without proof that uh, if you give me any shortest curve in M, uh, then it is um, well, of course, connecting distinct points, right? Uh, I mean, it's not a shortest curve from what from a point to itself, but uh, from one point to a different point. It's so a kind of a shortest curve, which, which is not completely boring. And such a curve is always contained in the intersection of M with a two-dimensional uh, real vector space. So with a, with a plane in R3 that passes through the origin. So before going into the proof, let's, uh, let me uh, illustrate what, what the theorem says. So for instance, here in this image on the left, You can see here the, uh, a shortest curve on the hyperboloid, and this would be the corresponding uh, plane in R3 uh, containing it. And of course, it passes through the origin. And then, just as I said last time, it's important not to get confused, that, uh, not, not to think that because the plane passes through the origin, uh, that this origin is the point from where one takes the stereographic projection from the Poincaré disk to the hyperboloid. So because such a stereographic projection comes from 0, 0, minus 1. Uh, and then now here, the disk that you are seeing here is not Poincaré's disk. It's actually uh, uh, the, the, the klein beltrami disk that actually sitting at height 1. But this of of this disk we are going to speak uh, later on in the course, not today. Yeah. Here it's Poincaré's disk sitting at height zero. Here is another illustration of the theorem. Here the geodesic would be this one, the, the shortest curve, I'm sorry, would be this one, and the corresponding plane asserted uh, in the theorem would be this plane. containing my shortest curve. As, as I said, somehow the, the, what this theorem says in particular is that the shortest curve in the hyperboloid are, are kind of not, not completely chaotic or disorganized. One can, they are kind of very well organized in, in the sense that I can obtain all of them by simply taking a, taking a, a, a plane through the, through the origin and somehow letting it vary. And, as as long as I as as long as my the plane that I let vary is uh, anchored at the origin and actually intersects the hyperboloid, uh, one obtains a, a shortest curve. Yeah. Okay, so now let's let's prove the let's prove the theorem. Yeah, and so for that I take any point in the in the hyperboloid and I take any. Um, any non-zero tangent vector tangent at the tangent to the hyperboloid at the given point uh, and well this one this this non-zero vector of course in this two-dimensional space I can complete it to a basis yeah and I can I can complete it actually to a basis which is orthogonal right so if this one has its inner product and I have a non-zero vector I can take an orthogonal a vector ortho, non zero a non zero vector orthogonal to it and then i get an ortho, an, an, ortho, an orthogonal basis of the of the tangent plane yeah and and, and now i notice the following so recall that our curves gamma p uh, v which were which is is a, is the is a is a curve 
with that we already showed is a shortest curve passing through p at point zero, and at, and when passing through p, uh, its derivative is precisely this vector. Right? So somehow it's a it's a curve satisfying the initial conditions of passing through p with with the with the velocity v, right? uh, and so. And so, for for any for any um, uh, real number, we have that this um, this dot product is well. It's equal to this because of the formula for uh, for my curve. Right? That's just a formula for the curve. Uh, and now uh, v two. Well, of course, I have by by, by, by bilinearity. I can I can split this uh, this uh, um, Minkowski product into this times this plus this times this right so but this times this is zero because v two uh, is in is in the tangent space in the, the tangent the tangent plane to p uh, so 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 the pair the Minkowski pairing between p and v two is zero so I'm left only with the second summons. Yeah, but this summons is zero. Um, this summons is zero because uh, because v and v two are orthogonal, right? I, I took the, I, 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 I because of the way I took v two with respect to v. Okay, and what does this say? This says that this product is zero for every t, right? and we know that this is. Uh, sure, uh, 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 one of our shortest curves. So this means that the curve itself is completely contained in the Minkowski orthogonal to V2. Right? And this one is a two-dimensional uh, subspace of R3. Um, and, and, then, and that's it, right? So, so sure, the shortest curves are contained in the planes, um, and now, now, uh, as an exercise, one can one can prove kind of the, the other part, right? That's so now, if you take a plane passing through the origin that actually crosses the hyperboloid, um, then 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 the 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 curve at which it crosses the the hyperboloid is a shortest curve. Uh, this I will leave as an exercise. Um, also, let let's see. Let, uh, let's say in uh, in in, a, in the our, a picture of the hyperboloid. So let me find a picture of the hyperboloid. Maybe here. Of the two uh, sheeted hyperboloids. So like here and let me see. Yeah, maybe here, here. Um, you see, here is the origin, and then you see there are there are three types of two-dimensional planes of planes passing through the origin. Uh, three types, kind of, uh, with respect to the to Minkowski's form. One. Is uh, is one, the the ones that actually cross the hyperboloid, right? And somehow you see one can somehow let them vary, but kind of they all look like somehow like very kind of vertically aligned in a way. Um, and they are characterized by having some vector whose Minkowski product with itself is negative. Now there are there there is kind of those that kind of like somehow somehow in in the limit. Which kind of intersect intersect the the, the the light cone, but not the hyperboloid, right? So so something something like this, but not the hyperboloid. Yeah, and and those that those already those already do not cross the, the hyperboloid and have the property of containing a point whose Minkowski product with itself is zero, right? Um, and then, and then there are the ones that 
kind of lie more or less horizontally. And these are um, these are the ones that uh, you see that wh whenever you take a point there in, in such a plane, it's the Minkowski product with itself is positive, right? So somehow these are the, the planes that somehow very informally saying like, like sort of horizontally, uh, they are the planes at which Minkowski's form defines an inner product, right? And with a little bit of, of thought, you can you can see that these are actually the the planes that arise as Minkowski orthogonals to points in the hyperboloid, right? So somehow. But of course, of course, not not every two-dimensional plane passes passing through the origin uh, is one of, cuts the hyperboloid. Right? Um, okay, so 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 you see, so so but at least from 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 these uh, uh, three types of of, of uh, planes passing through the origin, there are two nice classes. One one is the class that intersects that actually crosses the, the hyperboloid and it's nice because we, we see that the, the, the curve at which it crosses is oh, uh, here yeah it's a, it's a shortest curve right and then there are there are these others that okay they do not cross but they are orthogonals to points in M and so they are the, they are tangent planes to points uh, in M and so they are Planes of the uh, the planes where the velocity vectors of the curves passing through the through such point live, right? and then there are kind of the limiting ones that somehow really really uh, cross a line uh, contained in the light cone. Um, okay. Uh, so let's uh, let's then go back here. Here I want to see to watch again um, the two videos that that we watched last time. So there, there you can see um, a shortest curve, and actually you can see a, a point traversing it, right? And you can see everything. You can see also the this this place through the origin that determines the shortest curve, right? And you can actually see the image of that shortest curve in the Poincaré disk under the stereographic projection, which goes from the point minus one zero zero. And you can you can see it here. Right? This is the minus one zero zero. Um, and here is the origin. Okay, so that's one of the videos, and then uh, the other video. Where you can see here how the, 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 they, they allow the, the plane to vary, and then you can see uh, how the corresponding shortest curve varies inside the, the, the hyperbola. Okay, in any case, the links to the videos are here in the notes. Yeah, and then here what I said, kind of complete the picture to because what I what I have proved is only that every shortest curve is contained in one of these uh, planes, and one one would like uh, the full round answer, right? That that uh, also when you when you take any plane that indeed intersects the the upper sheet of the hyperboloid, then that the intersection is a shortest curve. Right? So I, I ask you to, to complete the picture. And let us move on to uh, introducing our second model of the hyperbolic plane, or if it, it can be okay, okay, the third, the third, the third model, because we already introduced the, the Poincare disk with its hyperbolic metric, even though we haven't gone into studying it. 
in full depth. We, we just used it as a tool to, act, to, 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 help us to, to help us prove that our curves were shortest curves in the hyperboloid. We will go back to the to 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 um, to, uh, to giving a, a full description of the of the Poincaré disk uh, later in the course. But so today today I'm going to be speaking about the the, the upper half plane. Right. Um, now the, there's something which I find very nice, which is to to actually visualize how the how the hyperboloid corresponds to the Poincaré disk. And 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 uh, how the the upper half plane actually can be seen to to is seen to correspond to Poincaré di Poincaré's disk, right? We 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 made we made them correspond under the um, under Kiley's transformation, yeah. And so so now let me give a bit a little visualization. So here. In this picture, you can see, of course, the upper sheet of the hyperboloid here. Uh, you can see this klein Beltrami model, of which I'm going to speak only later. Uh, Poincaré's disk sitting at height zero. Uh, and, and you see the, here, is, here is the, 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 the north hemisphere. And, well, we can, we, 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 Make the, the, the this this uh, north hemisphere correspond to to Poincaré's disk through the um, through stereographic projection, but now again from the south, right? Not from the north as we did in the in the at the beginning of the course, right? And a good exercise is to see to see how the, the what's the relation between uh, let's say the algebraic relation between the stereographic projection from the South Pole and the stereographic projection uh, from the North Pole between the sphere and the and C bar, right? So today we are doing it from the South Pole, and this stereographic projection, of course, makes makes uh, uh, makes curves here uh, correspond to curves on the on the on the on the on the North Hemisphere, right? And now. Uh, if one keeps projecting from the south pole, you see, like for instance, here I here I project and then I ar I reach this I arrive to the, at the sphere, but then if I keep going, then I arrive at the corresponding point in the hyperboloid. Right? Um, so somehow this same stereographic projection from this same point from the south pole allows me to get from from the Poincaré disk to uh, both to how to the sphere, right, to the sphere, or, or to you know to the hemisphere, and to the hyperbola. Right? So it's that's that's what's nice about this that it's the same stereograph. It's projecting from the same point. Um, and yeah, now uh, here you can see a, a similar picture. And and the point of passing through the hemisphere is that from the hemisphere we can apply another stereographic projection and reach the the upper half plane. Right? So somehow here, after projecting from here, you see from the Poincaré disk to the to the sphere, I'm already on the sphere, and then I and then I ask myself, okay, so, and now from there. How do I go to the to the hyperbola to the to the upper half plane, and hopefully, the way I find to go from the north hemisphere to the to the upper half plane is precisely Kiley's transformation, right? Hopefully, and that that is indeed the case. And what one does is you see uh, here here I really have you see the 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 the, the um, Poincaré disk sitting here like this. This would be, uh, you see, here is minus one in the Poincaré disk here. Here is the here is the complex number minus one, the complex number minus i, i one. So here, it this is this has to be um, one minus one i minus i, right? So this is kind of this is how I see the the plane here. Um, and 
And what I do is I stereographically project to the, to the vertical plane here uh, with stereographic projection from, from this point. Right? So, so somehow here, if, if you draw this that I, that I drew before, and then you say this is one i minus one minus i here, this is inside here, what sits is precisely this, right? which projects onto this. Right? And then in order to pass to the upper half plane, one puts now the complex the complex plane but sitting vertically sitting now in this which would be kind of the the y z um, plane and projects from uh, from this point stereographically projects from this point right? and when one projects from the sphere now to 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 to, to, to this plane what one of one what obtains is precisely this this picture. Okay, so 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 at least now we know how uh, how to pass how how the the passing between models looks like visually. Okay, and of course again this this I I did not draw these figures. Um, these figures were were uh, drawn by other people. Um, Okay, and then here, here you re recall that Kylie transform Kylie's transformation comes from this matrix, and it's actually defined on the whole C bar, and we saw that it restricts to a diffeomorphism from U to D, from the upper half plane to the Poincaré disk. Now, we are going to do something similar to 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 how we defined the hyperbolic metric on the disk, because kind of what we did was to pull it from uh, the feomorphism from the disk to the hyperboloid, because we already had um, a, a Riemannian metric on the hyperboloid. Now we already have a Riemannian metric on D, um, and so we're just going to pull it through uh, Kyle's transformation, and uh, well, that we call it the, the hyperbolic Riemannian metric on the, on the upper half plane, and it's simply kind of, it's the same, the same idea, right? The, the, if I take a point and two tangent vectors, uh, I define the, the inner product between the two tangent vectors at, at the tangent plane at Z to be the corresponding inner product, but at, here it would be, here I would have to write mu uh, one minus one, one, one of Z. So, so the inner product at, at this point, well, at the tangent plane at this point, of what? Well, what can I do? Well, I have, I have this way to go from U to D, and this is a diffeomorphism, so these tangent vectors are mapped to tangent vectors by the derivative. Right? So that's what I do. I take, I take the derivative, the derivative of the function at the point Z, and I, I send my two tangent vectors, and, and uh, in the codomain, I take the inner product, and that's that's how I define the inner product between the original two. So it's 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 precisely it's the same philosophy by which I pulled uh, the the Riemannian metric on on Minkowski's hyperboloid to a Riemannian metric on G. Right. So now I'm pulling it one step further to U. Right. So of course, of course, by 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 following. Uh, by composing this with the stereographic projection from D to U, one can see that this is actually, again, being pulled from the hyperboloid in the end. Um, first question, okay, exhibit uh, um, an explicit formula, that's possible. And the formula is, again, very, very beautiful, I would say, because if you take a point in the upper half plane and take two tangent vectors, then the, 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 the hyperbolic inner product between the two uh, tangent vectors is the usual dot product of, of uh, R2, 
scaled by a quantity depending on where the point Z is located. And this dependence on where the point Z is located uh, is, is very visual because um, you see, if, uh, if, the, if the imaginary part of Z is very big, then this is very big, so this is very small. So this means that if I draw the upper half plane, um, let's say that this is that's the the, uh, the real axis, and let's say that uh, I don't know that this is the imaginary axis. Although I don't really need it, I don't need really need to draw to draw it. And what this means is, for instance, take take uh, take the same take, take the same tangent vector, let's say v v. So that so that this really gives me the square of the norm. So so it's kind of it really gives me an idea of the size of the vector v. And so it says, okay, it's 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 the its size, it's Euclidean size. Right? So let's say that I'm sitting here in Z and it's V. Yeah, but kind of rescaled, taking into account how where Z is located, in such a way that if Z is very close to the x-axis then the length of this vector is actually very big, right? So again, identifying all the tangent planes at you, you see uh, with, uh, at any point in, in uh, of, of u with R two, which we can do because u is an open in R two. So you, if you want, it's it's a chart itself. So we can make this this identification canonically for and for all sets in u. And then I take one vector in R2, and then somehow what I do is just move the point at which it's anchored. And then if I if I get if I move the, this point close to the x-axis, this same vector becomes becomes very long here. Right? And kind of and if I move away from the x-axis, somehow the same vector becomes very short. Uh, away from the x-axis, right? from the real axis. Um, so somehow, somehow, think somehow close here. Things become very long, or curves become very long. Hence, we should expect that points that he, he, that close to here, the distances become very big. Okay. Um, so one can see that from from this uh, uh, formula. And now you see one one point is okay, but so but how do you come up with the, with the fact that it has to be this factor, right? And why this square? What not? Why not something else, etc.? Right? Why not some other power, etc.? And somehow my, that that my point is that somehow that is why I started with the hyperboloid and then pulled back from there to everywhere, right? Because in the hyperboloid, it's very natural to consider Minkowski's uh, form. And then and then and then I just pull back and then see okay so whatever formula I obtain right and then fortunately the, the the formula is still still has still some visual meaning but 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 uh but the explanation of why the formula well it's just because I'm pulling everything from the hyperbola okay and then just as in the case of the hyperboloid we want to directly determine. Uh, the Riemannian isometries of our new um, of, of our new Riemannian manifold, okay, namely u con u con this uh, Riemannian metric, and uh, and the, the the first thing we are going to prove is that PSL two R, which we already introduced, is uh, is contained in the group of isometries that preserve the orientation. Okay? So Kind of before go, before diving into into the into into uh, into the, into this, let me perhaps just remind you. Right. So we saw that uh, we saw that for for any matrix in SL two C. Um, well, maybe let me start with the following. We we first saw that uh, every every Mobius transformation transformation 
of C bar is of the form. So can be written as the Mobius transformation of a ma matrix of determinant one. For mu A with A in uh, SL2 C and SL2 C. Right. That's one thing, that's that's something we proved. And then another thing we prove is that for every matrix in uh, SL to C, uh, it is equivalent, the following are equivalent, that uh, mu A preserves the upper half plane bijectively. And this is equivalent to A actually belonging to SL to R. Now, now from here, what I from from here what I obtain, you see, when I when I consider the subgroup SL2R of SL2C, what I obtain what I obtain, and then, and we saw this earlier in the course, is um, I I have SL2R, yeah, and then from here. I can I can go to the Mobius transformations, right? Of course, to the Mobius transformations. Um, to the Mobius transformations of C bar that preserve uh, U. Right. So, uh, well, okay. So let me let me just. Um, let me just write maybe this, although this is not a, a, a notation that I'm going to be using standard, standardly, it's kind of just for the moment. Yeah, so, so we have this map. For any matrix, to any matrix in SL2R, we can associate a Mobius transformation that preserves you bijectively, right? Uh, and any Mobius transformation that preserves you bijectively is of the form uh, mu a is of the form mu a with something here, but because of this, it would be with something in SL2R. So this this is a surjective group homomorphism, right? And then when you when you look for its kernel, it's actually just plus minus one, or maybe I have to say plus minus the identity minus the identity matrix. Uh, and this is big, big, and, and and the fact that the kernel of this of this group homomorphism is, is what I'm saying is because we characterize uh, when when any two given uh, matrices give you the same Mobius transformation. Right? So if you specialize the discussion we had to this domain, uh, you obtain that this is the kernel of this one. Okay. Um, but then, have, so, so we have this short exact sequence, but then that's, that means that, you see, by definition, PSL2R is simply the quotient SL2R divided by modulo this. So the fact that we have this short, short exact sequence tells us that we actually have an isomorphism here. Um, Okay, and so so I'm just going to be writing PSL2R to denote the group of Mobius transformations that preserve U bijectively. Okay, um, and now without any further apology. So take a Mobius transformation preserving U bijectively, and now. What I claim is that uh, it is a, a Riemannian isometry of the upper half plane with the hyperbolic Riemannian metric. Now, proof. So you see, we one has one has the polarization uh, formula for sym symmetric bilinear forms for given for for a fixed z. G Z is a bilinear form from uh, 
the tangent plane cross the tangent plane to R. So we can apply the polarization formula, which tells us that this inner product of between any two vectors can be written uh, in this form. Right? Now, the advantage of writing that in that form is that uh, here, this one is an inner product of something with itself. This is an inner product of something with itself, and same thing here. Right? So somehow, somehow, the, what, the, what the polarization formula tells us, one of the things that the polarization formula tells us is that the inner product of two things can be written as, can be kind of compartmentalized and written as, as in terms of inner products of, of several, of, thing, of a thing with itself, thing with itself, thing with itself separately. Um, okay, and because, and because of this, and, uh, well, well, furthermore, uh, you see, then it, it, it's enough to show, to show this equality for every, um, I mean, what do we want to show? We want to show that, uh, we want to show that uh, G in the point mu, sorry, in the point nu of Z between uh, the images of these two vectors, but the images of those two vectors, as we have said, are computed through the derivative of mu, right? and of course here at the point Z of uh, U, and then here derivative of nu at Z V, and we want to show that this that this is equal to this, right? Now we know that this is equal to this, and we know that there is a corresponding expression, uh, the corresponding polarization formula for this one, right? Which, which would be to equal to something, right? Something one half of an of a norm square, something uh, minus uh, etc. And somehow, you see, to, to obtain the equality I want, which is this equal to this, it's enough to show that this is equal to this. And in order to show that, it's enough to show, you see, that that, uh, that, that at the level of, that, that the derivative preserves norm square. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, uh, my my uh, Mobius transformation will well. We know that it's it comes from a matrix right? in SL two R. Right? That's uh, because I, I assume this and this is and this is uh, equivalent to to, uh, to coming from a matrix uh, in SL two R, right? as we as we mentioned. Now, you see for any for any point in the in the upper half plane, nu of z is also in the upper half plane. So 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 we can just take the derivative as as we used to do it in when we were taking a, 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 the first class in complex uh, analysis. And then the derivative is simply multiplication by well by by kind of just taking the expression for for nu. Right, this alpha z plus beta divided by gamma z plus delta, and then just taking its derivative as in complex analysis. That's what we obtain. But here, here we use look, the, 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 the following. So first of all, gamma z alpha goes away with gamma z gamma, with alpha z gamma, sorry. And so, and, what, and I'm left with uh, delta alpha minus, uh, um, delta alpha minus beta gamma which is just the determinant of this matrix, which is one, because I'm in SL2R. So, so the derivative actually has a very nice form, right? It's, it's multiplying by just this quantity. Okay, now, for, you see, if we write Z in terms of its, uh, as, as, a plus bi, so in terms of its real and imaginary parts, 
well, we, 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 we just start computing, right? So its image under new is, uh, well, it's of course this, right? And here I only substituted this Z, right? And then, well, I just uh, developed the, the product, okay? Right, and well, develop it and can can and just separate it into into its imaginary part and its real part. Right. Now, and now, I want to to divide by this, so I do I perform the trick of multiplying and dividing at the same time by its conjugate. Right, and its conjugate it's this one. Right, and now now I I, I also for I also substitute this z here. Well, I mean, set and then conjugate, so it's it's minus b, minus b, and this minus b goes with gamma. Okay, and then and then I I uh, I develop the product and collect you see collect imaginary part and real part. Um, okay, and then. You see a bit more computation actually sees the the only the b survive here right in the imaginary part uh, so let's see alpha alpha b gamma a minus alpha a uh, gamma b goes away right and then um and then and then for instance i have alpha b delta minus beta gamma b right so i get b times the determinant and so only this b survives because the determinant is one okay so what what conclusion do i draw from that well that the imaginary part of nu of z is well what is it is b divided by this quantity right? so the imaginary part of nu of z is the imaginary part of the original num of the original z divided by the quantity. Okay. Now, why why do I why do I do this computation? Uh, well, I I do it because uh, because for this norm, you see, uh, I have to for that norm square, I have to 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 to, to consider imaginary parts. So I have, I have to divide by the square of the imaginary part of the point I'm based at. So this norm, well, which is by definition just uh, the inner product of the thing with itself, is, and then here's, here is what I said, which is you, have, you divide by the square of the imaginary part of the point at which, at which you are based. Right, and then, and then uh, times um, times. You see um, here. I am. Right. So so, and then and then you have to take this inner pro just just the Euclidean product of this point with itself. But this with itself, uh, that with itself is, you see, the derivative, this derivative, this derivative, as we saw, is take the vector and multiply it with this, right? So, so that derivative, d nu of z of b, is um, is one divided by gamma z plus delta, square times v. Uh, sorry, with without uh, with parentheses, not not with a not with norm. And so that means that that when I when I take you see, I, I already divided by this extra factor that I that I had here, and now I have to take the inner product, the Euclidean inner product of the vector with itself. 
So I have to take the Euclidean linear product of this vector with itself, that is of this vector with itself. And, th and that is where this, where this, uh, um, ah, you yeah, know, so it, that's, that's here. That's just the norm square of this vector, the norm square of this vector. Okay. Um, now, um, so here, here you have, here, here, you see, I'm taking the norm square, the norm square of this vector, but this, notice, just this vector, I obtained it by multiplying this V as complex number with this complex number, right? I mean, the point is that Z ha has non-zero imaginary part. So this is a complex number, but you see, so, and so this is, an, this is norm really of a complex number, but if you think of it that way, then, then the norm of complex numbers opens and so you can pull, you can you can take this out with just norm to the fourth, okay, and then be left with just the norm of b with itself. I mean the, the inner pro, the, just the Euclidean inner product of b with itself. Yeah, and then here here this imaginary part, you see I substitute. So this has to be on top. This has to be on bottom. Uh, this has to be on top, so on top, but I have a square here, so a fourth, and here has to be on, on bottom, but then square, so with square, and you see, and there is a, here a, a cancellation, this goes again, a, a, away with this, and this survives, but you see this is precisely, this is precisely this expression, but for, for, for u equal to v. So it's just the, the inner product of V with itself, which is the norm square. Right? And so, so I proved that this norm square is equal to this norm square. And then, as I said, the theorem follows because it that because it that this this equality sufficed in order to have the equality I wanted, this equal to this, because of the polarization formula. Okay, so nice are Mobius transformations preserving the uh, the upper half plane um, are remaining isometries. And now let's move on to uh, computing the shortest curves here. So what I'm going to do is, is something similar to what I did in the hyperboloid. So in the hyperboloid, uh, first I considered a special, you, you see I gave, I gave some candidates to shortest curves, but first I took, I took a special case, namely, w w namely the, the hyperbolas, Parameterized with a with a hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine, but that are contained in the xz plane. Uh, so kind of I did uh, like first first I focused on a specific type or a specific class of uh, of curves, just just those those segments of hyperbola contained in the xz plane, uh, and then and then I and then I uh, I, I argued uh, then I, I showed that those were shortest curves. And then afterwards, I argued more generally by uh, applying uh, Riemannian isometries that took my points, my arbitrary pairs of points, to the xz plane, and 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 and, and then I deduced uh, the uh, uh, deduced that other that my other candidates were also shortest curves. I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to start with um, now with the with the imaginary axis. In the upper half plane, and I'm going to, to show that the segments in the imaginary axis are shortest curves, and then I'm going to uh, and then and then to to, to in for the for general pairs of points, what I'm going to do is any pair of points I'm going to to to, to I'm going to map them to the to the to the um, to the 
imaginary axes and then map and then map them back. Okay, so the strategy is more or less similar. Now, take any two real numbers, and you see somehow I'm interested in the points AI and AI and BI, right? Which lie in the in the in the in the imaginary axis. So somehow here is AI, here is BI. Uh, and then I I, uh, I parameterize this segment well, kind of in the obvious way, right? Because somehow I don't quite know yet how how the shortest curves are naturally parameterized, or or how the how parameterization by arc length looks like. So I parameterized in the kind of in the obvious way, the kind of the, the first that comes to my mind, and I compute its hyperbolic length. Right? So the hyperbolic length is Recall that the hyperbolic length was kind of more conceptually was um, defined as the as the integral along the interval of the norm of the derivative and of course that norm well has to be taken at the point at, at which the tangent vector is based right and then and then uh, and then uh, when you tr and the norm, this norm, of course, according to the corresponding uh, Riemannian metric, or Riemannian metric is this one G, this G, G U here. So it's so this becomes this square root of this. Right. Um, okay. Now, gamma prime of t in this case is just i, right? I mean, as, as a curve, as a curve living in in R two, let's say. Is you see its, it's derivative is just the, the just zero one, right? So it's i. This is also i for every t, right? and this point will is of course ti. Okay. Now, when I I have to compute this um, this inner product, and then as I said, it's, it's just the Euclidean product between i and i, um, which is just you see i and i is just zero times zero plus one times one that's this dot product times times one divided by the square of the of the imaginary part of ti right? so t square which is here right and then i have to take square root okay square root so so this integral it's just this integral um Square root of a square just becomes the absolute value of, of the of, of, of the thing be, be, before the square, but t is positive, of course. Right? I mean, at least from a to b, t is positive, and this integral we know it. It's just the logarithm, the, the difference of the logarithms of the of the li of the limits of integration. Okay, so this was easy. Uh, the length, the length of, of, of kind of my obvious candidate connecting A to B in the upper half plane is just this lo this natural logarithm. Um, and now and now comes the, the harder part, which is showing that it's actually the shortest curve, that this is a shortest curve connecting them. So in other words, I'm I'm in this situation. Let me let me sketch. So there is my um, real axis, let's say the imaginary axis. Okay, the pictures are really not perfect. Um, and I have my points, my points AI, AB, BI, sorry, as I said before. And so far I, I, uh, I already computed the hyperbolic length of that curve that you are seeing here, but with this parameterization. Now, what I want is that is to see that any other curve going from A to B is actually hyperbolically longer. Right? So either because because let's let's say that either either because it actually leaves the, the the imaginary axis at some point, or 
because even if it doesn't leave, then, then it's, it starts kind of turning around within the imaginary axis. Okay, so that's what I want. Now, um, you see, I would say that that any 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 curve, any curve here that that uh, kind of that that without leaving the the uh, the imaginary axis kind of bends and and like back traces, let's say, is uh, of, is I would say obviously longer than this gamma. So I'm really just going to focus on uh, on the situation where the curve leaves the imaginary axis. Okay. Now take any take any curve, right? Now parameterized with uh, with any interval, right? But going from the right place to the right place. And of course, we we write this delta in terms of its real and imaginary parts, with, which then are functions from CD to, uh, to the real numbers. Uh, and, and I want to compare the length of delta with the length of gamma. Now, the length of delta is, again, by definition, this integral of the corresponding square root. Right? Uh, now, this inner product is, well, you have to take the inner product Euclid an inner product of this with itself, which just becomes this sum of squares, divided by the, 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 the imaginary by the square of the imaginary part of where delta is located. Okay. From here to here, you know, I just split into two in, you see with the common denominator. Okay, and now the point the point is that uh, this is always non-negative. This is always non-negative, and and look, this is this actually measures. This actually measures. Um, you see that the points where the points t where this is not zero somehow measure the po the points the, the possible points where I can leave the the, the imaginary axis. Um, okay. Now the the point is this is non-negative. So this quantity is greater or equal than this quantity. So the integrals, this integral is greater or equal than this integral. Okay, now this square root of a square is uh, absolute value of, of the thing without the square. Now this is positive, so it doesn't need an absolute, an absolute value sign, but this one I don't know, so this one needs it. Okay, but in any case, every anything, any any, absolute, any number is less or equal than it than it, its absolute value. Hence, this integral is greater or equal than this integral. Okay, and this integral, you see, I recognize it because I can first I can perform a change of variables, and then I can just take the logarithm, and so what I obtain is that. This is the logarithm from from sorry is the difference of logarithms bit, uh, a bit at y of d and y of c but y of d and y and y of y of d and y of c you see are precisely uh, a and b because that's where where delta begins and, and finishes okay and this is the length of gamma. Right, so, so the length of delta was indeed greater or equal than the length of gamma. Um, yeah, and actually this analysis applies in both in both situations, whether you leave or whether you don't leave, right? Whether you, you kind of just backtrack within the imaginary axis. So it doesn't matter. I didn't need to. It, it wasn't actually necessary to, uh, to divide into those two cases. Yeah, now, now a nice exercise, you see, now we know that this gamma is a shortest curve. Um, well, find a parametrization using arc length, hyperbolic arc length. Um, yeah, for that, for this, for this, it may help the formula for, um, for uh, hyper, 
five hyperbolic distance that we are we are about to find later. Um, another one, another eh, no, this can be done directly. Yeah, sorry, because because uh, for at, at, you see at any point at any point in the interval you can just compute the 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 distance you have traveled from a to gamma of that point, right? and then use that to just the, to just uh, compute the parameterization by arc length. So so yeah, so this is not such a hard exercise actually. Okay, and now now the the next step of the strategy to to, to finding uh, shortest curves. So kind of we are in the quest of finding all the shortest curves in the upper half plane. We already found some nice family, namely the kind of the, the segments of the of the imaginary axis. But of course, the segments that are contained in U, right? Uh, somehow. Now, all this time when I've been saying imaginary axis, I'm really thinking only, only about the part of the imaginary axis which is contained in U. Uh, so for instance, what, something, something that, that can be said is that uh, you see translation, horizontal translations, horizontal translations um, are Mobius transformations and preserve the upper half plane bijectively. So they are Riemannian isometries. So, short, so shortest length, a shortest length curve always goes to a shortest length curve by, a, by, by such a transformation. So, at least I know that, at least right now, I know that vertical segments are shortest curves. Okay, but now, now uh, but I want something more general. So I want to find all shortest curves in U. And this is and the key lemma is this one. Somehow, what it tells me is if you give me two distinct points, um, yeah, if you give me two points, yeah, let's say distinct, uh, it is possible to put them, say, in standard form. Somehow, you see, it is possible to 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 send them through a Mobius transformation to the positive part of the re, of the imaginary axis. Right, and this is this is the lemma that is going to allow us to then pull back to uh, to the points W and Z. Well, this and of course the the conformality of nu and the fact that we know that nu sends circles to circles and so on. But okay, so let's prove this lemma. We suppose that they are different because if they are equal, it, the, the lemma is obvious. And now something. Something which is also obvious is that if I focus on W, there is of course a, a Mobius transformation that sends uh, W to I. Right? So, so like for instance, uh, so let let me draw again real axis and uh, positive part of the imaginary axis, and let's say that my my point W is here. So the first thing I can do is is I can translate to the left, so that so that my point now lies on in the imaginary axis. Okay, but it, of course it, it may it may it may lie here, but at, but at a height different from one, right? And I want it at height one. Uh, okay, but but notice that multiplying by a positive real number always preserves the upper half plane bijectively. So, so multiplying by a positive real number really defines an element of the PSL two R, and and then I can with that I can calibrate the height so that it so that so that let's say it becomes here one let's say. Okay, so so with these two easy to describe types of transformations, I can send W to I. That's the first thing I do. Now, uh, now what I'm going to realize is that um, the Kiley transformation, right, which goes from I mean from C bar to C bar, but it's a uh, in the end in the end it, it gives me a transformation from U to D. And I, I just re, re, recall, I remind you that that uh, 
we took it to send infinity to one. So, so here one uh, goes to infinity under the Kylie transformation. Um, well, I actually goes to zero. And zero goes to minus one. Oops, sorry, zero goes to minus one. Okay, now what's the point of, 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 of this observation? Well, that if I look at the if I look at uh, at the disk, you see around zero. Something I can see is that any rotation around zero preserves the disk bijectively right? and this and, and seeing that here is harder right? seeing that seeing what that should correspond to around the point i in the upper half plane is harder than seeing just in the, that in the unit disk the co the point that corresponds to i namely zero is uh, uh, has a property that any rotation around it really preserves the disk right so when i when i take any such rotation and i conjugate it with the with the inverse of the Kylie transformation um, and i conjugate it with with the Kylie transformation what i obtain is some transformation here that we later are going to see how how their geometry looks like precisely but that somehow allows me to somehow rotate around here. That's kind of the point. And then, and then with that rotation, I can, I can, I can. You see, my my point Z is somewhere, right? I mean, my, not my point Z, but you see, to W I already applied this new, which put it here, and so what is somewhere around there is this new one of Z somewhere around there and now with with this rotation that i mentioned i can just put it here right? now putting it here really corresponds to the 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 the, the, the image of new one of z on there the kyle transformation which is somewhere just putting it into in on the on the interval uh, minus one one which Right, so so you see what happens is that that after I sent W to I with new one, now my point my point Z is sent of course to new one of Z, and what I want is to to, to what I want is some Mobius transformation that that puts this point here. So what I do somehow somehow what I want okay but I don't I I. I want to put this one here, but somehow I, I don't want this to move because that's already in the correct place. So so what I want is some sort of rotation, right? Some sort of rota some sort of rotation around this point. Now, here in the upper half plane is kind of it's 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 hard to see directly that such a transformation exists, and that is why I, I go to the to the disk with the with the Kyle transformation because in the disk. I see that the image of i is zero, and and in and here in the disk I can rotate um, around zero, preserving d. So when I when I when I conjugate and I go back to the upper half plane, what I obtain is is a rotation. You see, it's something that allows this to move without this moving, right? And finally, just just noticing that the image of the of this is is the the interval minus one one. What one sees is that here the problem becomes sending a point to this in, to this interval, but that with a rotation. But that's it's obvious that one can do that with with a rotation, which it's a Mobius transformation that preserves the disk. Since it preserves the disks, since it preserves the disk, when I go back to the to the to the upper half plane, I obtain a Mobius transformation that preserves the upper half plane bijectively. And I am done. Right. Now, so so you see, for any two points, any two points, so 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 any two points can be put here, 
up to applying a Mobius transformation preserving the upper half plane bijectively. Now, any Mobius transformation preserving the upper half plane bijectively is conformal and sends circles to circles. Right? That, that, that property was always there. Right? Um, Okay, and so now now take take your two points W and Z, right? And then let's say that here is the the real axis, and here is the the positive part of the imaginary axis. Now, with them with a Mobius transformation, uh, nu, I can send them to um, to I. And I don't know, so I let's say nu of w, and I don't know whatever here is nu of z. Right now, between these two points, between the images, I know how to compute a shortest curve, namely just this Euclidean segment. Okay, and now how do I compute a shortest curve between the two original points? Well, I map back. I use nu inverse, and I and I apply it to to this segment. Now this segment is of course a segment in the of of a, of a of a circle in C bar because the imaginary axis is a circle in C bar right I mean okay together with a point at infinity of C bar okay so the image under new inverse is of let's say of the whole imaginary axis union infinity is some is some circle that of course then passes through these two points so this would be like the whole image. Now, what else do we know about that? About this, about this circle? Well, here you see here I have this is orthogonal to the, to the real axis. So this circle is going to be orthogonal to the imagine to the orthogonal to the image of R bar under new inverse. But new inverse preserves u bijectively, so it preserves r bar bijectively. So the image of r bar under new inverse is r bar. So what I obtain is here um, orthogonality with r bar. Right? So what do I obtain? Well, that the short that a shortest curve between the, my two original points is a segment of a circle in C bar orthogonal to R bar. Right? And of course, if I since I'm focusing only on the upper half plane, somehow I'm not I, in, in I mean I discard this this part. Okay. Now my argument so far has only justified that between these two points there exists one shortest curve, which is a segment of a circle orthogonal, blah blah. And the theorem is saying more. It's saying that I already found all shortest curves in, uh, in, in the upper half plane. Right? And this, um, the fact that I already found all of them, I leave them to you as an exercise. Um, somehow, the, the, somehow it, it's already hidden here, you see, actually in these computations. Um, so somehow it suffices, first, first part of the exercise, it suffices to show that this curve, up to reparametrization, is the only curve from AI to BI, uh, the only shortest curve from, B, from AI to BI. Um, so it's enough to show that. And second, it is indeed the case. Um, so we, we indeed found all of them, all shortest curves. Exercise a little bit harder than the previous one. Take arbitrary points and and write down the the, the shortest curve joining them. Uh, but 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 write it down using param using par uh, parametrization by arc length. It, it shouldn't be so hard, you see, because now this I mean. What shouldn't be so hard? The circles in C bar perpendicular to R bar are precisely either the, this this type of circles, right, or just verticals, 
uh, Euclidean vertical uh, lines or, or line segments. And that's it. And those, those two are easy to parameterize, but the problem is that those parametrization, the, the kind of the obvious parametrizations of, of a vertical segment and of such a circle, which would be using just uh, the Euclidean cosine and sine, uh, they may fail to be parametrization by uh, hyperbolic R lengths. So it's easy to parametrize them, but what is not so easy is to find parametrizations by arc lengths. Um, yeah, so let me let me show you some some shortest curves here. So there you have a short a, the shortest curve between these two points, right? So so somehow this what I, one of the the claim is that this segment when you when you draw the whole circle the whole the whole Euclidean circle containing it is going to cross r bar perpendicularly but okay but so now we can start moving the point and that that is somehow how the the um, the, the shortest curve moves with it etc um right and let me let me also show you a little bit of um, this parametrization by arc length. So when 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 things are parametrized by arc length, what does it mean? It means that that the rapidity is constant. So not the velocity, right? Because now actually the velocity the velocity may change, the direction may change, but the rapidity do, doesn't change. Um, and so let's say let let me let me go from a point. To, from one point to another point, and let's say I have that point, and then let's say I want to see how how does it look like going from that point to the point I'm going to I'm, I'm about to click on um, with constant rapidity, and this is how it looks like. And it arrives. So you see. Um, when one is sitting somehow Euclideanly close to the real axis, the curve seems to move slow, uh, more more slowly. And and when when the when it when when the when one is kind of a bit far from the from R bar from the real axis, the curve seems to seems to move faster in the at least kind of Euclideanly. So there, there you can see. And it goes slow, faster and faster and faster and faster, and now slower and slower, 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 slower. And this is because, as I said before, the closer we get to, to our bar, the, the longer the distances become because of that of because of that factor one divided by imaginary one one divided by square of the imaginary part uh, of set. And so, so distances here are longer. And so if they are longer, if one traverses at constant rapidity, of course, takes long, takes more time to traverse. Right? So that's that's kind of the, the the full reason. So let's let's see one one more example. So it seems to be sort of faster and now sort of slower. Yeah, and I say sort of faster, so sort of slower, because this this slower and faster really is with our Euclidean eyes, but uh, but with a hyperbolic eyes, they, it's really constant rapidity. Um, and now, and there's there is a, a a very nice feature of of a hyperbolic geometry, or of the upper half plane. And it's it's also a feature shared by the Poincaré disk, as we will see, which is that the hyperbolic circles in U are precisely the Euclidean circles uh, contained in U. Um, so that's the next theorem that we want that we want to prove. So the, the the Euclidean circles 
the hyperbolic circles are precisely those Euclidean circles that are contained in U. So at the level of circles, nothing too strange happens. Um, but now I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to leave this for next lecture.